Krillin had tools, teamwork and martial art experience at his disposal that was very important and useful in battle situations, which made up for his insufficient level of power to the main characters of each arc, preferably in Dragon Ball Z. In early Dragon Ball, Krillin wasn't light years behind the main villains, but when Z came about, Krillin was indeed small fright of the likes of Raditz, Vegeta and Frieza, and the power gap was widening. However, like I mentioned, despite being irrelevant in one-on-one -on -one combat situations and in terms of power, you could never take your eyes off Krillin because he could kill you twice if he wanted to with that Destructo disc, or heck, Solar Flare into the Destructo, which would have been totally overpowered if you think about it. And I'm talking about the times before Perfect Cell. Anyway, with that being said, I always had a respect for Krillin despite him being shat on for years by those pesky myths online about characters being trash that end up being Chinese whispers and then newer fans start to believe it. You know what I'm talking about guys, Krillin, Yamcha, that's how it goes. But if you are a true Dragon Ball fan, you'll know how important Krillin really was, of course. Say and sell more merchandise than Krillin, but let's give this guy credit where it's due. He's a human, like us. Krillin is relatable. If we were in Dragon Ball, we would be trying to keep up with all those space aliens. And we would be scared at times of tyrants like Frieza because we're just plain old humans. We don't want to walk to our deaths. We are humans who want to enjoy the fun things in life. Heck, all Krillin ever wanted was a girlfriend and enjoy life in that way. Took him a while but ended up okay. The dude never looked for war, but would always rise up whenever he was needed. Even though he knew he was screwed from the start, the dude had courage in my opinion. Krillin was not a coward to me overall. The types of situation Krillin had to face would resemble us having to walk head on up the motorway. Like one hit and we're dead. But one thing that has always been overlooked with Krillin is his power. Sure, he's more of a support character in the arcs in Dragon Ball Z and in most games. And once the Cell games were done, Krillin was just a comic relief dude. And this theme went on for years all of the way into Dragon Ball Super. And we're talking decades after the Boo saga ever hit on TV or in the manga. The days of Krillin being relevant seemed like a lifetime ago. And I know there are some fans out there who haven't watched the original Dragon Ball to understand the journey of Krillin, which is a shame and you should definitely do that. And when we consider how far Goku had gone at that point in Super compared to the time Goku was on planet Namek as a regular Super Saiyan, we are talking light years of power ahead. So seeing Krillin's performance against Goku, man it was epic and we're so excited to see Krillin really give Goku a fight somewhat. Despite us knowing how strong Goku was, we really saw the moves that made Krillin Krillin. The cunning techniques to give him an edge where he lacks power. But even his power against the Super Saiyan Goku at that point in Super should never be underestimated. Did Krillin's Destructo Disc have the power to slice up Super Saiyan Goku there in Super? There's a part of me that thinks, damn, I don't want that hitting Goku in any way. He launched a Kamehameha at Super Saiyan Blue Goku and we know he wasn't going to win. He is pushing against God powers at that point in Super where that blue power boy, it's way ahead of Super Saiyan Goku on Namek. It's pretty remarkable. I mean, what if Krillin was pushing against Super Saiyan Goku there in that beam struggle? Sure, Super Saiyan Goku would still win in my opinion, but that Super Saiyan Goku is again light years ahead of Super Saiyan Goku on Namek. Krillin's power from his performance in Super is above Super Saiyan Goku on Namek, and yes, it's still a Super Saiyan. Krillin has the power to beat and even kill a certain level of Super Saiyan, but did we ever think we would hear Krillin is stronger than a Super Saiyan? Ever? Never! He has the 100 times solar flare which is pretty remarkable showing us that he can blind someone even if their eyes were closed, messing up their senses long enough for Krillin to slice them up. And I'm not saying Krillin would ever do this to his friends but the reason I'm bringing it up is to support Krillin and show that he does indeed have the potential to do it. I really hope you enjoy this video guys, I know we're talking about Krillin. Krillin these days in Super with his new level of mind, body and spirit is not a force to be underestimated and in the world of Dragon Ball, Krillin has my respect. We have to remember that Krillin was the third part of that original team. Master Roshi, Goku and Krillin. The master and student rivalry. And I just feel Krillin has been left out of this somehow. Or there's still much more to come. And it goes way back and that was at the time Krillin had the most spotlight he's ever had. And since then Krillin has always been there to help. Always stayed in the game somehow. Fought and trained hard. And always went to the big fights he knew he couldn't win. But as Master Roshi said, we don't master martial arts to win fights, we do it to conquer ourselves. And I feel Krillin has shown so much dedication to the art in Dragon Ball. Even at the end of GT, he's still there with Master Roshi. Krillin has so much loyalty to his master and teachings, and I feel this is totally overshadowed. I feel Krillin in the anime of Super had shown this mental growth, not only to raise his strength levels, 
but more importantly to put his mind, body and spirit in sync once again and truly feel that was an opening for the third piece of the puzzle to demonstrate his ultra instinct to go with Goku and Roshi. Not only is Krillin a meaningful character in terms of his growth and what he stands for, but also showing that the best warriors are the ones who conquer themselves and wield everything they have in the moment of a fight. Krillin has fought for so long just as much as Goku and has had sufficient training through the years. If there's anyone who has a wide range of experience and muscle memory similar to Goku, it's Krillin. And for him to enter a state of Ultra Instinct, Krillin has what it takes to sustain being in that state because of how he demonstrated his growth in the anime when he overcame a lot of his personal problems in relation to combat. Some seem to think that you have to have a certain level of power to use Ultra Instinct because Goku was matching and surpassing Jiren. But as we've clearly seen in the manga, it has nothing to do with how physically strong you are or your fighting strength. And in the manga, we also see that Master Roshi indeed knows the foundation of what it takes to enter the state of mind. And as Master Roshi said, it's not about big powers. It never was. Principles that were introduced in early Dragon Ball, but as time went on, slowly became forgotten and overshadowed by the bigger, beefier transformations and power levels. Point being, Ultra Instinct pays more respect and links to martial arts more than any transformational technique that Goku uses that I can think of at this time. Master Roshi to this day in Dragon Ball is still Goku's mentor. As shown, he still has a few tricks up his sleeve to teach Goku in terms of mind, body, and spirit. And when we go way back to the beginning of Dragon Ball, all of these martial arts principles were where guys like Roshi, Goku, and Krillin were flourishing. Even Tien and Yamcha. Because this is what these guys were all about. Martial arts. And I don't know if you've noticed, but in the Dragon Ball Super Manga now, we constantly start seeing spectators and fighters start disregarding the super powerful transformations. Trying to tell us that the story is not all about big powers anymore. And this is where dedication, determined warriors like Krillin can see an opportunity to shine once again. Plain old fight in strength. Who the heck taught you that? Vegeta, Freezer? And this was basically the Dragon Ball Super manga saying, screw fight in strength now. I'd like to see a warrior win through his own abilities, wisdom, motivation, and practice. Training versus training. You know what? i double down if Dragon Ball went back to how it was in early Dragon Ball when fighters demonstrated their potential in a tournament match and beat the villains through their art. Goku vs Krillin, Tien vs Yamcha, fights like that to me was so much more relatable. But why do I think Krillin above all other characters that would be next in line for Ultra Instinct? Vegeta is sorted and looked after in terms of what he's got and how he's identified. The same goes for Gohan, he has his ultimate form and that should be explored even further. So much potential there in what he can do with that. Piccolo should be going down a different path to Ultra Instinct. If there's a guy who I'd probably put next to Krillin more than anyone else to showcase the mastery of themselves, it would be Ten Shin Han. Ten Shin Han to me is like Krillin in terms of their commitment and loyalty to martial arts. Everything I believe Dragon Ball stands for. And the reason I say Krillin is because, like I said, his resurgence of determination is super and also it gives his character something special that only a set few can master. He doesn't have to be the one trick pony with the destructo disc. I'm kind of sick of seeing Krillin used for just those purposes now. His character is so much more than that. The writers just need to give him a shot. I mean, Krillin's not exactly complaining, is he? Maybe some don't think Krillin deserves Ultra Instinct, but I think he does. That state of mind shown in the Tournament of Power shows us that it's something not for the physically strong fighters. I respect Krillin for all he's done and survived through in Dragon Ball. Should Krillin be the one? That's what I'm asking. What's important is to note how Krillin looks at the end of Z and how Yamcha looks at the end of Z. Let's check that out first. Straight away, aging has shown on Krillin even 10 years after Boo, but Yamcha, this guy is obviously drinking from the fountain of youth. But not many fans look at End of Z Krillin first to see how he's aging. They jump from Boo Saga straight to GT, which isn't a good idea, it's quite unfair. During the End of Z, Krillin as we know is one year older than Goku, and is born in age 736. The 28th Budokai Tenkaichi is held in 784, making Krillin 48 years old during the End of Z. Yamcha and Tien are three years older than Krillin, both born in age 733, so End of Z Yamcha and Tien are actually 51 years old. But even more, the biggest confusion is the comparison and portrayal of Krillin in terms of age compared to Yamcha and Tien in GT. Now Yamcha and Tien range from 55 to 60 years old here, and both of these guys look like they're rocking some Saiyan DNA. But poor old Krillin, literally, he succumbed to age, quite apparently. So what the hell happened? Why does Krillin look like a 70 year old whilst the older Tien and Yamcha are still rocking the looks? 
Well, it has a lot to do with the Tash of Krillin. You see, the Moustache is a very powerful equip item. It gives the user plus 35% knowledge, plus 50% strength, and the wearer gains a 20 charisma point increase every one minute. But most importantly, it makes any Tash wielder look older than they actually are. Sometimes a moustache can actually make the person look 20 years older. Never underestimate the Tash. It even affected Vegeta's age portrayal. Let's get rid of the Tash from Krillin and give it to GT Yamcha and GT Tien. There we go. Ages are coming closer together already. Yikes. Yamcha's gonna be leading the biker gang to Hollywood Hogan's voodoo child theme. Okay, so this still doesn't explain why a younger Krillin still looks like he hasn't aged well. And this could be as simple as genetics. Some humans age faster than others. Human biological fact. Some humans look great in their 50s and 60s. Another factor could be lifestyle. And I feel this is a major factor and a subtle hint through the writing, through the storytelling, and how in Dragon Ball as well, people who let themselves go, stop training, turn into garbage physically. Now it's obvious, isn't it? You look after your health, your well-being, your fitness, you physically look and act better when you're older. You also can at times appear younger just by maintaining a fresh lifestyle and working out. Now Krillin stopped training in my guesstimations. Actually, he probably did, right? And didn't keep up training like Tien, who was shown to be training with Chiaotzu during the end of GT. That's a committed role model in terms of his training right there. This could have affected Krillin's physical well-being in terms of his lack of training. But what about Yamcha? Well, Yamcha is a guy who probably trains for vanity, let's be honest. And as lame as it is, it's still working out. He probably trains in the gym and tries to pull all the women, gets a full body massage, and most of all, he doesn't have any responsibilities. Think about it, this guy lives a life of luxury and all self. He has time to look after his looks, he can get his sleep. Yamcha is the definition of all those young single people out there who get an easy life but live a lonely one, unless you're that one night stand kind of person. But Krillin, this man has a family. He has a wife, child. If any of you have kids or are married, your sleep pattern is rocked harder than Super Saiyan 3 Goku shaking the planet. Your physical and mental welfare is put to the test as a family man every single day and working out. Finding time for that is a killer, but it can be done with good discipline and commitment. The problem is, it's so easy not to train. It's so easy to just focus on the wife, focus on work, which Krillin obviously did in Super, he was a lethal weapon cop, and then he has a kid which is going to be a challenge in itself. Krillin endured stress from the Boo Saga onwards in terms of his life. Stress that I think a lot of us can relate to, and that stress does age you. The grey hairs, the bags under your eyes, the lack of energy, to the point where Krillin actually started rocking the dad tash, just like Vegeta to symbolise their full-time fathers. It's a progression of a character, a good one, but they have to sacrifice something. Krillin even more so, because he's not as genetically amped as Vegeta. That is why Krillin looks so old. Vegeta's a special case, say in DNA bro. But Yamcha and even Tien, both those guys focus on themselves but in different ways. And my best bet that makes sense is the lack of responsibility to other demands in the world, families, combined with the two of them keeping in good shape, it's really helped maintain their youthful looks. But let's be honest, another reason why Krillin ain't getting his sleep is because he's being sucked dry by Android 18, if you know what I mean. You talk about Android 19 and 20 being the energy sucking models, 18's got her own sucking device. And let me tell you this, for an Android with unlimited energy, Krillin's got his bloody work cut out for him every night with her demands. But put it this way, our boy Krillin lives like a king. I'd rather live 30 years like Krillin than live 50 years like Yamcha. And that's the bottom line because role model TN said so. So there you are scholars. I hope this cleared things up and makes you understand why Krillin looks so old in GT despite being 3 years younger than Tien and Yamcha. I don't care if he looks old in GT because to me, despite being not nearly as strong as the Saiyans and villains anymore, if ever, Krillin symbolizes a successful character who made it in life. He was a martial artist. His best friend is the main character of the show. He has a loving family whilst working to help others as a job and even on the sidelines help and save the world. I mean, screw age. If Android 18 still loves him and wants to be with him, this man is doing something right. never underestimate the potential of humans in Dragon Ball. Yes, the writers nerf them or don't give them much time, but there are times when their potential really shows and should definitely be explored. Let's quickly look at the potential of Chi Chi as a fighter and how could she have potentially been the strongest human at one point. When we look at Chi Chi's level of power in the tournament in Dragon Ball, it's something that can seriously be taken into consideration from a potential point of view when it comes to Gohan's potential. And Goten, he's even more broken. 
In the Weekly Jump issue number 31 in 1991, Chi Chi is stated to have a power level of 130 when power levels meant something. And this was in the tournament against Goku when she was 19 years old. Take note of that because it also says Goku's Super Kamehameha is 910 as well at the same time, which when comparing it to Goku's Kamehameha in the Raditz Saga, that being 924 and a base power of 416, it could be a safe bet to say Goku's base power in the Piccolo Jr. Saga was around 400 next to Chi Chi's 130. And that's quite a highball considering it's five years before the Raditz Saga. Now it's implying Goku kept somewhat active in the five years, not intensely, but somewhat. So five years after Piccolo's defeat, the Daisenshu gives Krillin's power level at 206. And we know around those times, Krillin trained with Master Roshi and surpassed him because Krillin didn't have much else to do or responsibilities, did he? No kids or whatever. So Krillin's power was obviously much less during the Piccolo Jr. Saga. And if Chi Chi had a power of 130, Chi Chi could have potentially been as strong as Krillin's level back then in the Piccolo Jr. Saga. It's incredible. Now, before we get into the whole debate of Chi Chi versus Goku in terms of power, we know what the writing did, okay? It made Goku fight in the Tournament of Power and made Chi Chi fight in the Tournament of Flower. But in early days of Dragon Ball, the comparison of 130 to 400 in terms of power levels cannot be overlooked. What could it have meant? Look how much training Goku received at the age of 19. He was trained by Kami, the God of Earth, Mr. Popo, and even the great Master Roshi. And you could even add Grandpa Gohan if you wanted to. Putting Goku and Chi Chi at the same age, let's say Chi Chi had trained with Mr. Popo, Kami, Master Roshi by the same time of the Piccolo Jr. Saga. She does indeed have some serious potential to progress and could easily have gone from a power level of 130 to closer to Goku's 400. Easily, but no, she probably just self-taught or got trained the basics by her dad. But interestingly, in Dragon Ball Z, the anime adventure video game put her power at 300 in the Saiyan Saga, which if you think about it, is three quarters of what Goku's was at that point. We could use that just to piss off the Chi Chi haters, but we won't. Here's a few extra awesome moments in the anime. Chi Chi spars with base Goten, pushing him back. And when Goten turns into a Super Saiyan, she takes a full on kick from a Super Saiyan and is fine. And I don't want to hear well Goten held back because it's his mother. Because he didn't even know he was a Super Saiyan. And for a child to transform into a Super Saiyan mid-combat in the moment, he would not hold back power. And his power would be roaring in the transformation, especially if it was the first time. And Chi Chi took it on the chin. We always hear in Dragon Ball that half Saiyans have more potential than full-blooded Saiyans. And does anyone even ask the question as to why this is? Go tell him part of the most busted hybrids, by the way. Has anyone stopped to realize that it may not be the Saiyan part, despite the biased Saiyan character writing? It's a strong assumption that it is the human part of the hybrid that's given the potential. And look where the human side comes from. But even if I'm being biased here, then the human versus Saiyan blood should be at least equal and balanced in potential. So why is the human side of Gohan the ignored part of his power? It's true that Saiyans get all of the spotlight due to plot, training opportunities, super cool battle perks such as Zenkai boosts, Super Saiyan, all of the really cool factors that made Gohan cool to begin with, and I agree. I loved every time Gohan got stronger. Such an invigorating feeling. But his human side was never given the credit. And going by her power I just talked about, she does indeed have the potential if she was given all of Goku's training masters at that point. We can say Gohan's 50% Saiyan power and Goten gives him the tools and perks to fight, but I've always believed that Gohan's potential, rage, emotions were from his human side, which fueled those Saiyan tools and perks to get the best out of them. Tien Shin Han, one of my favorite characters and one of the most iconic Dragon Ball and early Dragon Ball Z characters, showing a tenacity and determination like no other, making a grand appearance facing Goku, trying his utmost best to keep up with Saiyans and tyrants in the franchise, and even going as far to compete in the Cell Games and Tournament of Power, competitions where Tien knew he had zero chance, but he did it anyway, because he is fierce, he is brave, he has the dry beam, which can whip any fat ugly ass beast into shape, even if it's a thousand times stronger than him. Tien has earned respect. Tien always tried to maintain his dignity in fighting and kept his motivation and determination no matter the challenges. Everyone talks about Goku rising up to the occasion no matter the odds, but good old Tien lacked any sort of power compared to Goku in Z, and he still stepped up to face the Saiyans. Face Freezer when he arrived on Earth, face the androids, face Cell, hell, he showed up to try his best to f*** up Super Buu, Tien may be outgunned, but his honor and passion make him so damn likable to fans who have any sort of martial arts background or have faced obstacles in their life which they have to overcome even if they were overwhelmed. Tien is a symbol of effort, a goddamn role model. He always saw Goku as a rival, 
someone to keep up with, but he swallowed his pride more than once to accept Goku could never be caught. And Tien still kept in shape. Just look how f***ing jacked he is. People talk about Nappa and Broly, but goddamn Tien looks like he could snap the spine of Godzilla. Tien is a role model. Disciplined and devoted. He accepted he was wrong. Being in the Crane School, he soon found himself with the help of Master Roshi. He used to be ruthless, never caring, but he changed. Tien was the original. What is not to like about this guy? There's only so much screen time a guy like Tien can have. Especially in Z when Super Saiyan was a new thing, and everyone wanted that new flavor of the month. Boring old Tien became an obsolete number on the side of good. And could a guy like Tien ever recover from being pushed to the back? The first big plus of Tien is when he trashes Nam and then squares off against Yamcha. Yes, when those characters were written properly into the story. And the match was actually awesome. Obviously, Tien makes friends with Chaozu, which isn't exactly a big perk, but it gives Tien a sidekick like Yamcha had Pua. Wait, did I mention this guy had some epic Dragon Ball moves like the Solar Flare, Dodon Ray, and Tri Beam and Multi Form? Heck, the dude even used the Kamehameha against Roshi. And that fight with Roshi had some great storytelling. Tien's got some great moves. When Tien fights Goku, Tien learns Chaozu is rigging the fight, and Tien tells him to stop, showing that Tien is a fair fighter, even when he's coming off as the villain. I mean, wow, talk about honor. Tien's match against Goku was so important and meaningful. Tien changed his motives for the right reasons, moving away from Shen and Tao. Tien let Goku beat him up to make it fair for the biased interference. My god, this guy is a role model. And yes, he wins the tournament by beating Goku. A win is a win. Tien makes friends with the now Z Warriors and trains ready for the Piccolo Jr. Saga and the 23rd Martial Arts Tournament. Tien whips his former mentor and this shows us that Tien actually had a meaningful character development and faced his old demons to right his wrongs. But some may say in Goku and Tien's rematch that Tien was humiliated by having Goku make Tien's clothes fall off. This was comedy done right. Tien was still considered a major player here. A little comedy like this was fine because as we find out in early Z, Tien still had respect somewhat, but Tien is always humble, and this doesn't phase the guy in the long run. Again, role model. Oh, quick shout out to Tien and Launch, a little side story which showed us that Tien and Launch were cared about in terms of development for some time. That was until Launch just magically disappeared. Now, when we move to Dragon Ball Z, there are pros and cons to the fearsome Tien. Basically, in Z, Tien lives in a new world of stories where he is forced to survive, always hanging on by a thread with a Super Saiyan and Tyrant infested cast. Tien's pride, honor, and respect are basically smashed to bits as Z progresses, and the poor guy fights on. When the Saiyans arrive, Tien shows an awesome performance. He does all he can do until death, and for his friend Chaozu, because role model Tien, and it's gory as fuck. He loses an arm against Nappa, but Tien goes down like a badass. This guy is not afraid to fight all out. For God's sake, fast forward to Imperfect Cell, try beaming the shit out of him. He's not afraid to die for the right cause. Tien is a living, breathing Dragon Ball hero. Everything a hero should be. A role model. Damn f right. Of course, Tien's presence is sidelined for a long time when Saiyans take over the story and doesn't really make a huge comeback until prepping for Freeze's return. And boy oh boy, talk about jacked. This guy is always training despite being shit on by Toriyama in terms of power levels and pathetic human growth potential. He still turns up to face Freezer and the androids and fights the androids, gets choked out by Semedine and still turns up to face Cell and gives all he can against the Cell Juniors and Super Perfect Cell in the anime. You know, villains that are well above Super Saiyan levels. I mean, the only time Tien makes a big return is against Super Buu when he and Chaozu actually survive Buu's extinction attack. Because Tien's a goddamn role model. And he intervenes to save Gohan and gets kicked into the dirt by Buu. And Tien took that on the chin because you know what I'm going to say. Remember when Tien fought Future Trunks in the Bojack movie? Tien was sticking it to Trunks until that little sh** had to go and turn Super Saiyan. For anyone who doesn't know the golden rule of Dragon Ball Z, if a human forces a Saiyan to go Super Saiyan, the human wins. Look at him in GT for his age at the end of GT. He's as jacked as ever. Does this guy even age? He's supposed to be friggin' 57 years old and Krillin is 54. Tien is a goddamn leader, a role model to all who want to age with style. As a character for years, he's just put up with all of the sh** and he's still there, standing tall. But for us fans who love Tien, I'm so proud we stick together with the humans of Dragon Ball. Characters like Tien have our respect because of their internal growth and acceptance of position. He knows his limits, he accepts them, and he accepts you'll never catch Goku. But that never ever destroyed his determination to be the best he can be. And that's why Tien is a goddamn role model. And here's our boy Tien showing up to the fight and with brute force is able to hold back Cell against his will. Now, at this point in the show, and as much as I hated it, 
Tien wouldn't even have been able to take on Frieza in one-on-one -on -one combat, let alone a roided up cell. So what on earth is going on? Well, it's quite simple. The tri-beam, the Kiko-ho, or Shin Kiko-ho, the Neo tri-beam was the equalizer. It all started when Tien's power would rise up when he dug deep against Nappa, and ever since then, we knew Tien had the ability to heighten his power in drastic circumstances if needed, albeit it can kill him. But today, I will be primarily talking about the Cell Saga Tri-Beam and that power-up. As other times Tien used the Tri-Beam in the series, it potentially didn't elevate his power by that magnitude. There was something truly special about Tien's Tri-Beam against Cell and based off the magnitude of a power gap it closed. In order to push Cell back into the dirt, we can say the Tri-Beam is one of the greatest techniques ever in Dragon Ball history. Like, imagine it like this. We saw just how much Tien juiced up that Tri-Beam. Imagine Tien's power was on equal footing with Cell in terms of raw combat power. Then imagine him juicing up a Tri-Beam from there. What the heck would a theoretical Tri-Beam like that have done to Cell if the one he originally used pushed Cell back and he wasn't even in the same league in terms of power. It's incredible. He's a role model, of course. So just how strong did the Tri-Beam raise Tien's power by in order to push Cell back? The Tri-Beam is a key-based attack. It has the same principles as many other explosive beams or waves, but in this instance, I believe the Tri-Beam had more potential to raise the user's power even higher, and it had a larger multiplier than any other blast. Now, we can safely say Tien failed to inflict any sort of damage on Cell, but the knockback power itself was in full capacity. However, we have to remember the Tri-Beam is a key-based attack, and in order to push an enemy back, it requires force. The force that was generated was the result of Tien's power being multiplied that much to generate that force. Like, if someone threw a cardboard box at you, you're not going to move. So do you increase the weight of the box, or do you throw it even harder? Would the box need to be strong enough not to break when it hits you at high speed? These are important things to consider, and it's the same principle as the Tri-Beam. It has to be durable to hit Cell and not fade away. It had to hit him with impact. Sure, he didn't get damaged. We can put that down to the surface area of the blast, where it's not a piercing type attack like the special beam cannon, but more of a wide hit just to knock back the enemies. However, the force is still needed to be multiplied to that level in order to push Cell back. And we're not just talking about a basic knockback. Those tri-beams knock Cell's ass flying back into the dirt. Okay, so that's the physics part done. Let's get to the gritty maths and power levels, because power levels are bullshit as we all know. I found some old power level numbers we could roughly go by in some of the old guides. We have Android 16, who we can see is around the 300 million mark. He punched semi-perfect Cell square in the face, and Cell just looked at him in disgust. This is a punch coming from a very powerful android and caught Cell in the face directly. Think about that for a moment. Then we have a power level read-in for Tien at just around 300,000. And we have Cell standing there at a whopping 700 million. Of course, these aren't official, they're just guides. But if you want to argue one of them is out like by 50,000, then be my guest. It really doesn't matter that much. What's important is that a power of 341 million couldn't even shunt Cell. And this is a punch from 16 who uses the goddamn rocket punch with the same arms. It was a full body driven punch from an infinite energy android. No excuses. Then enter one role model by the name of Ten Shin Han and do the maths. And 16's power is at least 1,000 times that of Tien. You know something? I'd buy that. If you think about it, the multiplier for the Tri-Beam here is absolutely ridiculous considering we have proof in numbers back in the day that techniques like the Kamehameha only gave Goku a small multiplier boost as he concentrated it into a single point. Even Piccolo's special beam cannon roughly tripled his power, but over a thousand times? Man, yeah, that's our Tien. Even though I don't like it, I think Tien should have been written way stronger, but here we go. In order for Tien to generate enough force to push back Cell, he should technically need a power produced stronger than Android 16's attacks, right? Maybe that's not how power works, but this is Dragon Ball. Big power jumps really aren't that surprising anymore, right? And that's how I worked it out. The multiplier of Tien's Tri-Beam at this point in Dragon Ball Z granted him an increase of at least 1,000 times the power in order to slap Cell multiple times into the dirt. And what's crazy, he was doing it repeatedly, to which his last one still put Cell back and that meant Tien had the stamina beyond gods. But either way guys, the scene where Tien stands up to Cell is one of the most underrated clips in Dragon Ball Z history. I don't know how many Kiko Hoes he launched, it could have been a hundred for all we know, but the clip itself is nearly 10 minutes long and that's a long time to be firing tri-beams way outside your regular power level. I used to get so pissed off that the androids didn't hurry up and move when Tien told them to as well. Tien makes an appearance in the Buu Saga and deflects Buu Tanks' energy blast. 
Now it's hard to determine Tien's power level because his tri-beam only hit Boo's energy ball, of course. We've seen weaker fighters interfere in the past and throw an energy blast to hit another big blast into a different direction and save their friends. So there's no way we can say Tien's tri-beam power equals Boo Tanks' energy blast, raw power versus raw power, but there's a way we can have fun and highball Tien to determine his power level from the tri-beam. So let's just say for argument's sake his tri-beam power did somehow get close to the power of Butanks' blast. Insane, I know, but Tien did in fact shut it down. Now, we all know how insane Tien's tri-beam multiplier is in the Cell Saga. I'm sorry, Kiko Ho! It's just ridiculous. Tien did indeed stop Butanks' blast. He did more than Piccolo ever did to Boo. So prove me wrong. Prove to me Tien isn't Piccolo levels in the Boo Saga. What a goddamn role model! Other than that, all I can think of why Tien's Kiko Ho was so strong was that he was putting his life force into it, which meant he was about to die quicker. But the whole life force thing has never been explained well in Dragon Ball. We see characters fire and blasts regularly in Dragon Ball and then fainting after shooting them through exhaustion. Was that their key or their life energy? It's always up in the air. If that's the case, I'm putting life energy into attacks to raise their power by at least a thousand times. Why didn't Goku put his life energy into the warp Kamehameha to kill Cell, you know? God, it gets so confusing. Well, the only reason why he couldn't and no one else can is because they are not TN. But yeah, I'm not saying the Neo Tri-Beam makes TN's power exactly 1,000 times greater, but it's cool as hell either way how much stronger TN gets from using the Neo Tri-Beam. And I know you guys love it too. When Saiyans were the center focus, TN comes out of nowhere and treats Cell's new form like dog shit. Great writing. We know Bulma is far beyond a genius scientifically because of her history in Dragon Ball, and of course I feel her father helps her and teaches her a lot about science, but we have to think, she takes on board all of the knowledge of her father to enhance her own, so she has potentially surpassed Dr. Brief's level of science. He invented the capsules, but I'm pretty confident now Bulma could build those if she wanted to. When she was very young, she invented a radar to track the mystical power of the Dragon Balls to extreme precision. Even the Red Ribbon Army technology could only get a general area, which kind of gives us an idea already of the level of intelligence with Bulma and Dr. Jiro, who was the scientist for the Army's technology. And this was Bulma, as a child, able to create something superior to that evil organization. She can make devices that shrinks others, an Ant-Man suit, can take the initiative to build devices out of household items. During the Saiyan Saga, she got hold of a scouter and managed to convert the device from another planet into her own numeric system with no previous knowledge of it. She is so smart that she had the ability to see other people's work and creations and become accustomed to it very quickly, such as repairing Android 16 to full capacity, even making her own Saiyan armors which come from an alien race, and she also constructed a blood wave machine in Dragon Ball GT meant for an alien species to escalate them to the primal form of Super Saiyan 4. She was able to adapt and use the nameless Namekian's ancient Namekian spaceship, and in the Android Saga, she was so efficiently skilled with speed and intellect that she could read a few blueprints and create a shutdown device for two androids that could easily eat Super Saiyans and fuse Namekians for breakfast. The time machine is the one invention that stands out amongst Bulma's other inventions. A friggin' time machine. There's no way to downplay this invention, apart from the fact that it's so powerful that even gods hate it because it causes so many problems in the universe timeline. But a time machine built with limited resources in the broken future, I must add. She is incredible. Now when we look at Dr. Jiro, he is the scientist in the world that created androids strong enough to kill all the Z-Warriors to fuel his lust for revenge and hatred towards Goku. He created Cell, the perfect being, composed of cells from Frieza, Piccolo, Goku, Vegeta. He managed to turn himself into an android, giving himself eternal life in the process. Now the biggest difference between Bulma and Dr. Jiro are the intentions behind their science. Bulma uses his science to help others, whilst Dr. Jiro uses science in a more sinister way. But does that mean Bulma does not have the ability to use her science on the levels of Dr. Jiro if she one day decided to? She indeed has the intellect and resources to create and surpass anything Dr. Jiro did, especially after studying his own work. She looks at other people's creations and learns very quickly. We can't underestimate that. She is like a Saiyan when it comes to learning science. She grows stronger every time she sees something else. Dr. Jiro worked in a very poor environment environment with low resources in hiding, and he can't be downplayed because look what he built in that cave. 
Imagine he had Capsule Corp and other departments at his disposal. Then again, in the glorious Red Ribbon Army days, he did have a lot of resources, and perhaps the androids just didn't require that many facilities to create them. However, it all boils back to the Time Machine, a device that makes inventing anything else look like amateur play. But the problem with Giroux is that he tried to play God by creating Cell, and that was the huge weakness to him. Yes, the androids and Cell were very powerful, but this left the scientist six feet under. If Bulma were to create something of equal or better nature, she would have to ultimately survive the repercussions if she is to truly surpass Dr. Giroux. Does Bulma have what it takes to build androids, build something like Cell, and use drones to spy? I believe she could if she had that intention. If Bulma built these, she would have to ensure that they have good spirited personalities and motives, unlike Dr. Giro who created his androids with the notion to kill or claim power. That could have been the huge downfall to the control over them in the first place, as those motives kind of interferes with their selflessness. If Bulma built androids to rival Dr. Giro, to combat Cell, to combat Majin Buu or any future villains, they would have to have the intention to protect. They would have to have good morality then perhaps she would survive that way if she built stronger androids. However, just like Terminator, sometimes good intentions lead to bad things. So whatever she builds, she has to be very careful a judgment day doesn't come around. She would need the emergency button. Ultimately, I feel that would be one of the reasons she would not want to go down that power-hungry route because of Dr. Giroux's unfortunate end. Or she may have thought it was wrong from a moral standpoint to tamper with humans. However, if she could have built something like Android 16, where he turned out to be a nice guy and was fully machine, that would be the start of his success to combat pretty much all of the problems in Dragon Ball. But if she used her science to enhance humans, such as Krillin, Tien, Yamcha, imagine she modified them at the cellular level. We have to remember Android 17 and 18 were nothing before they were androids. We presume they weren't, but if Bulma used Dr. Giroux's science and modified Yamcha, Krillin, Tien, heck, even a Saiyan, can you imagine how powerful the forces of good would be? Vegeta with enhanced cellular power? She could make Saiyans incredibly strong. Not just in terms of cells, but technology she could give them. It's a good thing Vegeta and Goku just like fight in the old-fashioned way, but her science does indeed have the potential to do some crazy stuff. If we think about it, because the androids were stronger than Frieza and Super Saiyans at that point in the story, if Bulma used her science the way Dr. Giroux did, she may have indeed had the potential to rule the universe at one point. If Nia modified humans can reach space alien level and were created by a human in the first place, then it's not a far stretch to think Bulma could have done the same. But it all comes down to plot. That controls everything. Other than that, based on the inventions we saw from Bulma, perhaps her science is just specialized in a different area. But if she took that step, would her science consume her? Or would she have what it takes to control the power she wields and pull the plug if necessary? Yamcha has been the butt joke of Dragon Ball for God knows how long. This has all ultimately stemmed from this picture. And is this really an in-joke? Is it just to have a laugh, or are there some fans out there that really think Yamcha is the worst? I mean, as a joke, I can see why it would be funny. All franchises must have a butt joke, but when the joke starts solidifying itself wrongly as false facts, which some start believing, Yamcha has been a victim of that treatment. Maybe it's the Team 4 star references, maybe it's just pure ignorance of Yamcha as a character, maybe it's his early death in Z against the Cybermen, or maybe it's because of some fans who haven't actually watched the original Dragon Ball to know who Yamcha is properly, or his journey. So when they start watching Z and only Z, followed by Super, they can only see Yamcha as this throwaway character right off the bat. Let's go to where it all began. Yamcha is the first Z fighter to have ever fought Goku or have a slight edge over him in the series and is in fact Goku's first legit battle outside of his original home. And in a Dragon Ball Forever poll of the top 20 best characters, Yamcha was voted 15 above Tien, Bulma, and Android 17. So why is he still considered the joke of the series? Yamcha is a recurring character in Dragon Ball and has decent action scenes throughout the original Dragon Ball. Just to let you know how heroic Yamcha is if you don't already, he attacked Goku's Uzaru form when it had hold of Bulma. It's a frickin' Uzaru! He jumps on its tail and stuns the Great Ape long enough with the others for it to be cut off. Even his World's Martial Arts Tournament appearances are interesting. Of course, he's squashed in the quarterfinals, but at least he has progression here. And he has an interesting battle against the Invisible Man too. Yes, Yamcha does get wins. And he gets even more epic moments against Tien in the 22nd World's Martial Arts Tournament. If you haven't watched them, you definitely should. It's intense and some of the better Dragon Ball martial arts fights. 
There's even good chemistry when he has an injured leg and gets attacked by Tambourine. Even in the 23rd tournament, he gets defeated by Hero, who is Kami, and Yamcha is so damn respectful and humble, he congratulates Hero, who says Yamcha has great skills and potential, but needs to work on his focus and defense. But soon after, goes to Korin Tao and gets training. This dude Yamcha gets training from Roshi, Korin, Kami, and even King Kai and Z. This dude has experience, just not the writers to back him up. An interview with Akira Toriyama in the Chaozenshu states Yamcha is actually a pretty good cook as well, just to add that in there. Is it a joke or not? I don't know. And not only that, after his retirement from fighting, he still keeps up training to some degree. Remember, this guy is a pure human, not some crazy alien god or angel. He's damn good for his age. But it's when Dragon Ball Z starts is when the biggest downfall of Yamcha takes place. After an epic build-up of preparation training with Kami and prep for the Saiyans, Yamcha gets his shot against the aliens. And he steps up, volunteers to go first. The guts on this guy. Whoever says Yamcha is a coward are liars. Anyway, Yamcha did indeed beat that thing and was superior. But the sneaky little bastard jumps on him and explodes, taking Yamcha's life at the cost of its own. And it's here that Dragon Ball Z only fans see Yamcha as pathetic and a joke, not knowing his past. Which is sad really, because Yamcha is not that bad of a character, or he wasn't at the time. Yamcha's role in Dragon Ball Z becomes a comic relief for a while, with no real purpose. He just gets overshadowed by Super Saiyans left, right and center, and usually is there to make Vegeta look good. In the anime, Yamcha whips Rikum on King Kai's planet, which is actually pretty good at the time. Of course, Yamcha gets wiped out by Dr. Jiro, but he is indeed always ready for war in Z whenever he's needed. Heck, the dude joined the team to take on Cell and a bunch of Cell Juniors. He has guts, and let's be honest, he squared off against a Cell Junior in the anime and got some hits in. Dare I say the manga only made him get his ass beat, but he lived to tell the tale. And those were tough monsters. The Boo Saga wasn't that special for Yamcha. He was just a guy on the sidelines. His importance in Dragon Ball has already started decreasing from here. He gets killed by Super Boo, and in the anime only, he goes to the Grand Kai's planet and recovers his passion for fighting. And I don't really see any problem with this. Yamcha has totally been shat on over the years, by the writers and some fans, and this disrespect soon followed through into the video games and it's just totally unfair, but hey there was this really cool manga that came out based on Yamcha, and he also had some heroic moments in a variety of movies like Mystical Adventure, Sleeping Princess and the Devil's Castle, and Path to Power. It just seems that Yamcha's momentum was always stopped before it could ever truly begin, and with each passing arc in Dragon Ball history, getting Yamcha fired up just seemed more unlikely as time went on which is very apparent in Dragon Ball Super, as the only time he is relevant is in a baseball match. Yamcha is just there as barely even comic relief. He's just there. I mean, even with the disrespectful Yamcha death scene being replicated in Dragon Ball Super, where even Gohan and Piccolo pointed out as a bad memory, it's just, I can see the joke here, we all do, but this is the type of joke you would see in a fan manga or a meme. To think the writers themselves included this in the show is pretty darn bizarre and makes you wonder do even the writers lose their focus of characters and cave into the outside world jokes of Yamcha or other things and include them in the main story? Heck, in the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie, Goku even mentions his base form, shows how much fans have input. But it's quite disrespectful to their own writing to even acknowledge a Yamcha death position that has only ever been made infamous by Dragon Ball fans in the decades of Yamcha smack talk, not through the actual story. It's just another insult to Yamcha to solidify his purpose in Dragon Ball, or lack thereof, and destroying all hope that Yamcha is made into a true hero. And to put the nail in the coffin, he was just written out of the Tournament of Power with an even more belittled storyline. Even if Yamcha doesn't get a big victory, that's okay. As long as his character isn't tarnished, he just has to do something, show his talents, and be part of the team once again. We all love that, for being one of the only few full-blooded human fighters with a high power. Now in the Buu saga, Yamcha is pretty much living in peace. He didn't even compete in the tournament. It's hard to say where his power is, whether it's gotten weaker or stronger since the Cell Games, but everything changes when Yamcha gets killed by Super Buu later on. Because in the anime only, Yamcha goes to the other world and squashes that Oli Buu guy along with another fighter at the exact same time. He is so confident, he tells Krillin those guys couldn't even touch him. And it shows that Yamcha is in full control here. Krillin states, you can't get Yamcha to train on Earth, but here in the other world he's a star. So by the anime alone, it implies Yamcha lost his passion for fighting on Earth, and all he did when he was alive was get some R&R. &R. But now in the other world, he's got his fighting passion back. And that strongly implies that he hasn't done jack since the Cell games. So upon his death against Super Buu, it's highly likely Yamcha is the same as his Cell Saga self or weaker. As we know, the Buu Saga was not even two days worth. So we could say in less than one day, Yamcha has gone from a power level of approximately 1 million, maybe even less, to surpassing Oli Buu by a large margin. So now, 
we are talking about that Oli Boo. How strong is Oli Boo, you may ask? Well, this is a guy who, seven years before this in the anime, in the Otherworld tournament, took on PyCon with weighted clothing. Oli Boo took on PyCon as an equal match. Both fighters given excellent performances, and PyCon won where it came down to an elimination. They both shook hands. Both of them appeared in good condition. We could argue weighted clothing PyCon could be a smidge better than Oli Boo as he won through an elimination and not a beatdown. So we know where Oli Boo stands roughly, a smidge less than weighted clothing PyCon. Equals at best. So now let us talk about Goku versus PyCon. Now weighted clothing PyCon was equal to maxed out base Goku in the anime. They pushed each other back and forth and were both at a standstill. Goku was sweating, weighted clothing PyCon was sweating. This is a big indicator to their power as they both had to resort to powering up and removing the weighted clothing because they were both that equal. And this is base Goku who had just recently died and was in the Cell games. We could say a Zenkai boosted Goku after his Senzu too, and now with the extra buff whilst dead in the other world, this Goku is obviously superior to his Cell game self because in the anime, we see him use the Super Kaioken, something he never even managed whilst alive against Cell, and theories that his body could not take it. And that tells us his body is a much tougher rock whilst in the other world it can do a lot more, yet it is equal to weighted clothing Pycon. And then if we bring in that Olibu guy to the situation, even if it was just a smidge less than PyCon, it would also be a smidge less than base Goku after the Cell games too. But fast forward seven years later, in the other world, guys like Goku, PyCon and Olibu all train. Olibu would have gotten much stronger. So it is safe to say Olibu during the Buu saga has clearly surpassed base Goku in the Cell games. Absolutely, that's a solid bet and would make sense. It's been seven years. So then we have Yamcha who dies against Super Buu, a Yamcha with a mere 1 million power level in theory. Probably, maybe less. This guy alone trashed Oli Buu and another guy at the same time. It wasn't a close match. He smacked both of them. Now, I don't need to educate you guys because you're smart enough to realize this is an Oli Buu stronger than base Goku in the Cell Saga. Potentially more than base Goku in the other world against PyCon and other world Buu Saga Yamcha hit him down with his Wolf Fang slap. It's simple. If Yamcha trashed Buu Saga Oli Buu, Yamcha here in the other world trashes Cell Saga base Goku, at the least. Not Super Saiyan Goku, geez. Let's keep this in base. I don't know what the hell happened to Yamcha whilst he was in the other world in the Buu Saga, or what type of insane potential he unlocked in the anime, but in the anime he did smash Oli Buu, and we know what power Oli Buu had. This is not a joke, but it's actually insane how the Dragon Ball Z anime portrayed this. What does this actually mean in terms of his growth? Well, whatever power level base Goku was in the Cell Saga, Yamcha had gone from a 1 million-ish to Goku's base in less than a day. Why couldn't Yamcha stay dead? Imagine he stayed training there for another week, or just in time to come back to the tournament of power years down the line. The gods of destruction would have become the gods of excretion. He was getting insanely stronger with King Kai after the Saiyan Saga. The best thing for Yamcha is to actually die. The dead Yamcha meme that's been going around for years bringing negativity towards Yamcha could actually be the most positive thing yet for the character. It could have been the gateway to Yamcha's full power all along. Dead Yamcha is a goddamn godsend. Being eaten by Boo truly unlocked Yamcha's true power. Nobody wants to believe Yamcha was this strong in the anime, but he was, and as messy as the anime filler is, it happened. Yamcha was much stronger than base Goku in the Cell games, albeit seven years too late. But to be able to rival a Goku post Namek, not Super Saiyan, but Goku's base, that's incredible. And if you love the anime, we should accept that Yamcha's otherworld training potential is deadlier than Stone Cold Steve Austin with a can of whoop ass. Before Master Roshi, there was the original martial arts master and original hero of Dragon Ball, Master Mutaito. Today we are going to learn about the largely forgotten Dragon Ball hero of the past, Master Mutaito, or Mutaito as some call him. One of the greatest martial arts mentors of all time, the Earth's first real hero. He was Master Roshi's and Master Shen's teacher and taught them everything. Just looking at this guy straight away, he already portrays himself as a veteran. And that moustache gives him an extra 65% boost in all character stats. This guy looks like a wild martial artist and he was known to be one of the most disciplined and honorable warriors of all time who looked out for his students. His greatest accomplishment was being the human who created the evil containment wave and sacrificed himself to seal King Piccolo. The being who at that time was stronger than everyone, destroyed all of his students and terrorized the planet. And get this, the guy sealed him in a rice cooker. That's right, Master Mutaito is a goddamn rice cooker. But this incredible act cost the old man his life, but it brought peace 
freedom, justice and security to Earth for hundreds of years, when it was then Ebra Pilaf who was the stupid idiot to free King Piccolo, episode 129 of the original Dragon Ball, in which a young Goku travels to the past and battles Master Mutaito. This is where Goku learned much about the basics of Ki, where Master Roshi and Master Shen also learned it, to which that later led to Roshi developing the Kamehameha. Pretty cool background. If it wasn't for Master Mutaito, then the Kamehameha may have never been formed. The fact that he was the one who trained Master Roshi led to so many positive outcomes in the Dragon Ball world, including the rise of Goku. In terms of his power, he was actually able to best Goku, showing he was stronger. And this was during the time Goku trained with Mr. Popo. Scaling gets a bit messy here in the anime and manga. We could assume Kid Goku and young King Piccolo were on equal footing, but he had grown stronger since then according to Mr. Popo. When Goku traveled time and battled Master Mutaito, he beat Goku Goku with a single move. Even Goku was shocked, but that's in the anime. In the manga, Demon King Piccolo was stronger than Master clearly, so it makes more sense for Master Mutaito to be below the guide power level of 260 for Demon King Piccolo. But let me know who was stronger, Master Mutaito or Master Roshi in Dragon Ball Z. When he trained Goku, he was telling Goku some very familiar words. Clear your mind of all unnecessary thoughts. Focus. The rest is up to you. Sounds like Whis and the writers are recycling some old concepts for Ultra Instinct. Other than that, Master Mutaito is the original Ultra Instinct hero. I'm just kidding. But yeah, always funny to see old concepts repackaged. In terms of his abilities, the evil containment wave was his big one to seal evil beings in another dimension. But he was one of the first characters to have a great understanding of key energy and can slice a waterfall in two. Here's a fun fact about him. His hairstyle is the same as the wig Roshi used as Jackie Chun. This was possibly a homage to his master. Let me know below if you remember Master Mutaito or Master Mutaito and if you think he should have had a greater role. Another underrated human character but one of the first real heroes of Dragon Ball. She was the original transformation and gained the Super Saiyan looks before Super Saiyan was even an itch in its daddy's pants. If I had to sum up launch in one word, wild. The split personality character that had so much potential to be utilized further, she was a frequently recurring character in the original Dragon Ball, damn. When she was in rage mode, the original rage mode, nobody wanted to mess with this wild chick. She would shoot you in the teeth if you looked at her wrong. She had the most fiery of personalities. And yes, one a chew later with her sensitive nose. And you get the complete opposite, turning into a sweet and lovely lady who can even ride the Nimbus Cloud due to her good heart. It's no real secret. Launch became lost in the shuffle. She drew the short straw when it came to progression of the original Dragon Ball characters. There were way too many characters coming into Dragon Ball and unfortunately... Launch had to retire, or be forgotten. Let's overview the greatness of the character first. She's got a badass unique looking outfit. Of course, when she's rocking the blonde hair and personality, she's even more badass and intimidating as the criminal she is. To me, I always felt the split personality was one cool factor that kept her screen time interesting and tense, and kept me guessing. But her character would eventually grow, and you could see how her relationships with the other characters changed ever so slightly. And whenever she transformed, she would cause carnage, kick Red Ribbon Army soldiers' butts. She actually made Dragon Ball funny and had an awesome sense of humor. Of course, this became less and less relevant as Dragon Ball progressed, because there's only so much damage guns and grenades can do amongst the main characters. But throughout most of Dragon Ball, it was really cool to see her go wild. Launch's character grows and develops to the point that even her badass form starts listening with reason and actually becomes the look most fans associate her with. She's in love with a goddamn role model. Akira Toriyama threw away a good relationship and storyline to grow. And you know something, guys? I know a lot of you love Tien and Launch and are fans of the chemistry they shared. She even threatened to shoot King Piccolo if he tries to hurt the fearsome role model Tien. She's such a good-spirited character that she looks after Tien when he was hurt too. Dragon Ball Z was pretty much the death of Launch's character progression. Just when we thought Tien and Launch would progress into Z with a strong background and family future storytelling, along with Goku and Chi Chi, everything came to a sudden halt. Her character stopped progressing, and it was hinted she remained as a criminal in the badass form, doing the same stuff she always did. The recurring theme of badass launch trying to find Tien because she was obsessed and he had no interest absolutely ruined the steady flow of what could have been better for the both, with having them passively grow and work together. When Tien died against Nappa, Launch was seen drowning her sorrows in a bar in the anime version, and this signified the end. This signified that Akira Toriyama, Toei, whatever, did not give a damn. And it wasn't even done respectfully, think about it. After all that time in the original Dragon Ball that we knew Launch, 
grew to her and watch her grow and develop as potentially a main character at times. And for her story to just end like that, suddenly, what a betrayal. And we pretty much never see Launch again except in flashbacks. There were a few manga panels here and there and other material, like the Christmas special, but they really aren't that important. In the manga, the last time we see or hear about her is right at the beginning of Z, and it was just a mention. Oh, I forgot, she gives energy in the anime to help Goku fight Majin Buu. Yay! She was actually a tough cookie, the original badass lady in Dragon Ball. She has exceptional hand-to-hand -hand combat skills, she could take out tons of bodyguards, bounty hunters, and soldiers by herself. I read somewhere she had a power level of 18 compared to the average of 5. I'm sure anybody in real life would be happy being 3 to 4 times stronger than the average Joe. Her criminal lifestyle could have been overcome, and she could have had a story of redemption, and even putting her cunning skills and weaponry up against the villains in a more serious way. Though Mai seemed to be doing okay in Dragon Ball Super, right? But it seemed like she was only used for a comedic role by the end of her career. But I don't think she was in Dragon Ball Super at all, right? I did hear somewhere that Toyotaro drew launch and what she would look like now. In the 2003 Shonen Jump interview, Toriyama states, To tell you the truth, I totally forgot about her at one point. And then I remember her after a while and I had to think of a reason why she disappeared. So I made it seem as if she was running after Tien. So there you have it. Not only was Launch forgotten, but when she was remembered, Toriyama did not give a damn about her. How can you forget about a character like that? And that's the respect for the character. Maybe it would have been best if she just remained forgotten, rather than acknowledged, then treated like fodder. The last mention of Launch is by Akira Toriyama around the start of Dragon Ball Super Letting Us No Launch would still visit Tien from time to time. But I know many of us still think it was a very poor outcome and decision making on the writer's part. She's an original iconic Dragon Ball character and stands out from the rest. I will always like Launch, no matter if the main guys decide she's useless or if they bring in worse characters in replace of her. I don't care what anybody says, she was the real threat to the Super Saiyan concept with that blonde hair and green eyed transformation. If she was a recurring character through the Namek arc, the almighty Super Saiyan transformation appearance would have lost a hell of a lot of its momentum. Being introduced as a crime fighter, Videl started the events of the Boo Saga off with a bang by appearing as a tough, intimidating looking street fighter with low pigtails that could kick the head off a bank robber. She was not afraid of the intense action and not afraid of horrible people, and she had the strength and skill to back it up. She was raised with all the fame surrounding her, having Mr. Satan in all his glory after beating Cell. She always knew something was up about that, but she was basically living in her father's glory and deep down she hated it. This girl has her pride, has her dignity, and can't be fooled. She is always on your case and discover Gohan was the great Saiyan Marriage and parental responsibilities. She took those things seriously and with loyalty. We can't deny that. Let me tell you right now the purpose of Videl's character in one simple sentence. A side story love interest arc for Gohan. That is it. With all of the right qualities of being an awesome character, even at the point of the oversaturated Buu Saga, to just have the plug pulled, or heck, not even pull the plug, literally set up to eventually be an extra on the character sheet of Gohan. Yes, it's Gohan's time. I mean, who doesn't like Videl and how she was introduced? Sure, she was stubborn and hindered Gohan's training so she could learn how to fly and use key, but cut the girl some slack. She's kicking bad guys' asses without knowing what the heck key is, without flying, and she's showing progression by wanting to learn the basics of these techniques. And I love that part of the Boo Saga, or World Tournament Saga, whatever, because it brought Dragon Ball back to basics where everything had been going crazy power-wise in the Cell games. It made me feel like characters can start from scratch and still get good screen time that may amount to something. Yes, may amount but didn't. I always felt Videl had this fire to achieve her goals, or to be a super strong fighter. It seemed like it was part of her being. Of course, she grew up with her dad's false achievements, so she always trained hard to be the best she could be in her own way. She already started to break free of her dad, and was stronger than him, and that was all the drive her character needed to be a successful character in the long run. Videl is a favourite by many fans, if only Akira Toriyama had the idea and guts to go along with the character all along. It seemed like somewhere down the Boo Saga, she just switched. Her personality swapped faster than launch sneezing. She went from badass, strong assertive fighter, to sweet little princess who was head over heels for Gohan in a second. Okay, don't get me wrong, she could have been that for him behind closed doors, but damn man, way to butcher her momentum. Even with that shorter hairstyle, she was still pretty cool. It kept her image fresh. 
Some say when Videl lost the pigtail, she lost her spark, but hey. She had some epic move names too. Head Scissor Rush, Eagle Kick, Hawk Arrow, though I do think the pigtails kept her unique look. The last thing you want to do is look like another female character in Dragon- Oh my god, no! Look, in the tournament she fought Bobby's henchman Spopovich, and despite her getting beaten nearly to death, there was a more important message here. Not that Gohan cared for her, but in terms of her fight to spirit, Videl showed us that she is tough as nails. She will never give up. She fought until there was nothing left. Heck, despite it being outgunned in power, she would use her skills that could have been effective apart from the goddamn hacks. I think she actually broke his neck too. She did pretty well and should never be underestimated. I don't care that she lost to Spopovich. She was only just starting to develop her power. It's acceptable. But when did the downfall happen? Right after that. Then it became the Saiyan show once again. Even to this day, Videl gets some video game appearances and it's really awesome to see how much love Videl gets, how fans want her to be more recognized amongst the ever-expanding world of Dragon Ball and crazy powers. The story of Videl can be described as a writer's tease, grabbing the fans' attention, allowing us to grow and understand the background of Videl, playing with our feelings, giving her some progression, then just to shut the door on that awesome character and pretend like it never happened. It wasn't the love story with Gohan, it wasn't the mother's role, it wasn't the short hair, it wasn't the beatdown by Spopovich. It was the goddamn right in direction, slowly transitioning her from strong standalone character to Gohan's sidekick. In life and in battle. It's all about Gohan doesn't like fighting. Gohan doesn't have time to train. Gohan can't do this. Gohan can't do that. What about Videl? She liked fighting. She used to train with a mean look in her eye and beat the crap out of bad guys. When will she get time to train again? When will Gohan have the baby so Videl can go and develop her powers and become a hero on her own? What about Videl, writers? Even Bulma has fed important roles in Dragon Ball Super. All Videl gets is offering her services for Pan's saying potential in the womb to give Goku even more hype. In fact, it wasn't even Videl. It was Pan, technically. Videl became a vessel for the true savior in that moment. I don't think Dragon Ball GT gets off that easy. That's as equal as Z and Super for letting down the character of Videl. But at least in GT she geared up in the Great Saiyan Woman outfit to go and fight Super 17. Despite not getting there on time and also showing up to the Sin Shenron fight, you can't deny this girl's heart. Potential completely wasted. Perhaps even going further into the story of her mother and learning what happened with her and Mr. Satan, Videl could have been explored much more as well as her childhood and really a more serious way to tell the story of Mr. Satan than all the jokes. And I know many of us would have loved to have seen it rather than her being Gohan DLC. The stupid Saiyan woman outfit. The stupid Barry Khan story. No matter how strong her character was portrayed as a good mum, a good wife, we cannot deny the factors that by the writers linking her to Gohan, it completely destroyed her serious fight in storyline. Her character has become comfortable now, nice and complacent on the side. Gokul would have had what it took to slap Super Buu into another dimension. And this is going to be based fully on if Vegeta never arrived on the battlefield and it was left for Goku to make that decision to fuse with Hercule. He was a second away from fusing with him until he sensed Vegeta. We are going to continue with that story of events. Let us begin. For years, the Daisenshu guides give the fusion multiplier as A times B. But that in itself is a broken multiplier because there is no linear increase, but the stronger each part is, then the gap increases even more from the original fusion parts, which is not consistent to a set fusion multiplier, hence why it's broken. However, the fusion multiplier we will use for guides here today is with the two statements in the Dragon Ball Super anime and movie. The first is Vados, stating Kefla is the sum of both fusion parts, which is then tens of times stronger. Secondly, Gogeta in the Broly movie states it's not just the addition of the parts, but they are both magnified as well. So in a way, Vados and Gogeta statements are both identical in the way they're explaining the power increase in fusion. Now, where does that come in with Goku fusion? with Hercule. The fact that he is fusing with Goku not only adds his tiny power to Goku's, but then, according to the statement, that power is then magnified because of the fusion perks. So we can say Mr. Satan's additional power makes no difference to Goku's, but when they are added, it's almost like we are dealing with just Goku's power in the end anyway. But then we have to follow the fusion rules and magnify Goku's level of power, and magnifying his power tens of times. So where do we place Goku versus Buhan if Goku's power is magnified tens of times in his base? It's hard to say, but we know he is going to stand a much better chance. Now, when we hear tens of times, man, I've heard numbers ranging from 60 up to 190 because anything more than that would be classed as hundreds. And we have the right to theorize that because we are never told an exact number. But for theoretical purposes, let's say for an average, it's close to 100 times. Now, straight away, we know 100 times is the same as when a base form goes Super Saiyan 2. So in our minds, we can already picture how strong Goku would be roughly in his base form against Buhan and that he would be performing 
performing the same as a theoretical Super Saiyan 2 Goku against Buhan, which let's be honest, that isn't exactly a threat. We saw how Buhan manhandled both Goku and Vegeta at the same time before they fused. But the difference now is, that is the base form. If we assume Goku has the ability to transform into a Super Saiyan, heck, two or three, why not? Many theorize Vegito could hit Super Saiyan 3, and we know Vegeta isn't the reason for that, it's Goku. So Goku with Goku in it, Super Saiyan 3. So that's a 400 times multiplier on top of a level of power matching Super Saiyan 2 Goku. That's how we look at this. Imagine Super Saiyan 2 Goku versus Buhan, then Super Saiyan 2 Goku didn't get a 4 times increase to go Super Saiyan 3, no, no, but 400 times from the Super Saiyan 2. That may just be the deciding factor and enough power to beat Buhan depending on where we all scale Buhan. Do you think Buhan is over 400 times stronger than Super Saiyan 2 Goku? Or could we say, to make it easier, a power 100 times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku? Is that enough to beat Buhan? Or would it be close? Was base Vegito 100 times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku? And was base Vegito enough to beat Buhan? This is how we can kind of gauge things roughly. And remember, this is based on the fusion multiplier being times 100 using the tens of times statement through an average. The reality is, this could be a very close fight. The fusion multiplier could be even higher, but the fight could be closer than we ever thought. And it could be something like Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs Kid Buu, where there are debates on if Goku played his cards right, he could have won. Still, win or lose at this rate for Goku, this is still a better result than many thought he would perform at. And this is based on how the fusion works now with the statements. The thought that Goku would get weaker fusion with Mr. Satan was definitely a joke. The fusion doesn't create a fighter which is in the middle point between their power, but one factor I want us to consider now is that Goku is half Saiyan and half human. Just think what that means in terms of his potential, both with combat and how fast power surges can happen. We see it in hybrids all the time. Look at Gohan in Super, I said it a million times in the past. A knight eating marshmallows by the fire camping with Piccolo, and Gohan goes from zero to hero. Look at Trunks, a strong Super Saiyan 2, has a tantrum, and he's then smashing Super Saiyan Rose. All I'm saying is Goku is a goddamn half-breed. And that is something to consider when he has the fusion time fighting. One hour fighting in Dragon Ball is a long f time. And that's where Goku went from super to ultra, so I don't want to hear Goku cannot get growth surges in 40 minutes. It does have Goku included in the fusion after all, and that gives him the plot armor feat. Furthermore, it has Mr. Satan, the guy with a pretty good death record. But what about his moves? Theoretically, we are dealing with Goku's moveset with a twist of Mr. Satan's crazy karate chops. I just want to say, just because Hercule is not as strong as the others, don't count out his martial arts fighting experience. When Goku and Hercule are combined, that is one dangerous veteran when it comes to the martial arts techniques and close quarters combat. And that can help, especially with the power to back it up. So now I want us to think about the story of events. Let's say Goku had what it took and could win just barely against Buhan. Not a stomp, not unless Goku is really broke and can use a Kaioken on top of Super Saiyan 3 to finish Buhan quick, but then I think the fusion would just split in half because of the power overload. However, story-wise, Goku wins, the fusion wears off, Vegeta remains dead, everyone lives happily ever after with the Dragon Balls, right? Well, there are a few roadblocks. One B and the others inside Boo. Would Goku want to try and save them first? It could be very tough if they split inside Boo, but I don't think Hercule is the one to break the earring like Vegeta would. So fusion would probably happen again if needed. Or heck, they free Gohan and the others inside, and then Goku quickly puts the earring on an unconscious Gohan, and then we have Gokan inside, creating a shitstorm of events inside Boo to win the day. So what do you guys think? Could Goku beat Boo Han? Is fusion strong enough for even Goku to beat Buhan? What story of events would unfold? How powerful do you think Goku, Gotan is? What moves would he have? And being half Saiyan, half human, is that an advantage now? Leave your story of events below and what you thought about this video. I personally think he would beat Buhan based on the power of fusion and because Goku has that goddamn moustache.